All right, Ash, I think we are ready to go. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I know um, you've probably gotten a lot of questions about um, the CARES Act and, and what all it means for those um, that, who are interested. So I'm so glad that you took some time with us today to, uh, to be able to join us and talk about it. Have you been busy? I have been busy. Uh, you know, a lot of it has actually been working with businesses on this particular topic, on the Stimulus Act and the resources that are going to become available. A lot of folks are interested in it. So it's, uh, it's been a big part of what we've been doing the last several weeks. Yeah. Well, thank you. And for those who don't know, Ashley is the CEO and president of the Gulf Coast Business Council. And um, there's a number of accolades um, behind your name. Um, one of the ones, one of the ones that impresses me the most is that you have led uh, with two administrations, two governors um, in the state of Mississippi and led through crisis um, in both of those. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting with, with what's going on now. It, it makes me think a lot about, you know, what was happening 15 years ago. I came on to Governor Barber's office uh, just after Hurricane Katrina, and my job was to lead the hurricane recovery efforts. And so I was very involved in the FEMA recovery and all of the work with HUD and the Community Development Block Grant funds. Uh, and then I stayed on actually for a few years when Governor Bryant was elected. Uh, and so I spent about 10 years total working on Katrina recovery. And, uh, you know, here we are in another kind of crisis situation. Of course, that's not something that we're not used to here. I mean, you think about Katrina, the recession, the oil spill, the release of the Mississippi River water into the sound, which closed things down last year. Now this pandemic, you know, our businesses are probably more used to uh, disruptions than just about anybody else's. Definitely. Um, and that's one of the things that I think is important for all of us to know as Americans is that, you know, we've gone through crisis before and we're going to get through it. Right. Um, to that end, we know that this situation is ever evolving. Um, and, you know, the president signed um, in the CARES Act. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And for those that may uh, be like me that need a little deeper understanding, can you break that down in just good old plain English for us? What does this mean? Yeah, sure. So, let's just kind of go back to the, you know, what is the CARES Act? And, you know, a lot, it's, it's being called the CARES Act a lot more now, and that's sort of the official name of the legislation. But, you know, it's kind of what we always refer to in, in plain language as the stimulus bill. And uh, it's similar in some ways to what was done during the financial crisis back in 2008, 2009, when, uh, when the government, when Congress decided to try to stimulate the economy and try to help businesses that were hurting. And this is very similar. Uh, the total package is about $6 trillion. It's the biggest stimulus in the history of America. Uh, and there are a lot of different pieces of it. There are some pieces of it that uh, are, are made for big businesses, some of it that, that are made for individuals, uh, some of it's made for organizations, for states, for healthcare. And then a big piece of it is also for small business. And so it's for those, uh, those men and women that own small businesses in our communities that are obviously very disrupted by this event, who uh, have either had to completely shut down or who have seen their business go way down as a result of what's happening. Uh, and there's a few programs within this CARES Act that, it, that are designed for those business owners to access to try to give them a bridge to get through to the other side when the economy starts to reopen and when consumer spending starts to occur again. Okay. Uh, Ashley, can you help break that down into those segments so that people are able to hear exactly what this means for them? So for instance, sure. I know there's a couple of pieces that are in there, the PPP uh, uh, Paycheck Protection Program, and also the EIDL. Um, can you talk about each piece and how that affects folks? And then we'll move a little deeper into how they'll be able to connect themselves with those resources. Absolutely. But right now, what, what is in the act? What's in them? Yeah. So, well, you know, there are a lot of pieces of the CARES Act. And so, you know, I'm not going to give a comprehensive overview. It'd take us probably rest of the day and tomorrow to do that. But I'm going to talk about the big ones, the ones that will impact the most people. And th there are really two primarily one, uh, two, two ones primarily that are directed at small businesses. And that is the payroll protection program, which is a loan program and then the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, uh, which actually can become a, a grant because it can be forgiven. And so, you know, even though these are called loans, in some cases, uh, especially in the EIDL, there, there are provisions where it can forgive them. And let me just, I'm gonna take one, each one individually, because I think these are the two important ones that people would have the most questions about. 
you know, so the payroll protection program, it has specific uses. You can't just get the money and be eligible to use it for anything, but it can be used to make payroll. It can be used to do things like pay your utilities. So the, the why behind it, the purpose of it is to try to help businesses uh, keep going and stay in business, even if they're not necessarily operating through this pandemic and also to make sure that they can keep employees on the payroll. Uh, it does not require any collateral. Um, it can be uh, forgiven, uh, but it, it can only be forgiven if uh, it is approved and they will look at whether or not you have maintained employee and compensation levels for eight weeks after the loan is made. And so this is not one of those loans where if you still have employees on, and you get eligibility based on the employees and the compensation, uh, if you get the loan and then you let those employees go, then it's likely you have to be paying all of this back. And so that's, it's gonna be real important when people apply for this to understand what those forgiveness provisions look like um, so they can ensure that they're fully eligible. Um, your, the amount on this is variable. So you can apply for up to two and a half times the average, average monthly payroll of your business uh, for the prior 12 months, up to a maximum of $10 million. So it's a very, uh, it could be a very big program for a lot of small businesses. Um, if there is a portion of uh, the loan that is not forgiven, it's at a 1% interest rate. So very, very low interest loans. Uh, and you would not have to have any payments on that loan for the first six months after you took it out. So it's deferred six months. So essentially look at that loan program as, uh, as the program that is designed to help businesses that are uh, impacted, either uh, completely shut down, who are keeping employees on their payroll, or who are only doing a small percentage of the business they were doing before, who are still keeping their employees on their payroll, right. um, and who are still making their payroll. And essentially these loans are, are given by, uh, are given or backed by the government, I should say, uh, to allow for folks to keep those employees going and to keep that business existing through this. So that's one piece. Now, here's the important thing about this PPP program. Um, it is essentially a government-backed loan through the SBA, but it is, it is uh, applied for through SBA-approved lenders, which essentially are banks. Okay. And if you ha if if a small business has an existing relationship with a bank, that's the best place for them to start. Because in many cases, what we're seeing is that you know banks are servicing the loan applications from the businesses that are already already have relationships with them. They already have loans with them and do their banking there. So it's a good it's a good idea to start with your with your bank in terms of asking questions and and working through that process. There's a second program that's a little bit different. And that's called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Um, some of the people that are listening to this probably actually got this after Hurricane Katrina. There was a very similar program in place after Hurricane Katrina. And unlike the first loan, the PPP loan, which is used for operating expenses and payroll expenses, uh, this is really used for uh, temporary working capital. It's just an infusion of direct money, but it's a smaller loan program. 100% um, of it can be forgiven, but the maximum of the loan is only up to $10,000. Okay. So as opposed to the other one that's $10 million program, uh, up to $10 million program based on payroll for the prior 12 months, uh, this one is only a, up to $10,000 per business. Uh, but the thing about this program is it is also open to uh, sole proprietors and independent contractors. The, fir the first one is as well, I should mention that. Uh, both programs are open to sole proprietors and individual, individual contractors. Um, this one is also open to, uh, to private nonprofit corporations. Okay. And so most of the folks that are in the nonprofit sector, they would be applying for the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Um, the first one that we talked about, the PPP program, has six months before you have to start repaying it. The EIDL has 12 months. If it's not forgiven, it has 12 months. But it can be forgiven uh, and it can turn into a grant program. Um, 
This is actually applied for through the SBA website. So you would actually go on through SBA through their online portal to apply for this program. It's, it's a good one to apply for because it's gonna be widely available. But there are a couple of caveats on this one. Um, on the first program, the PPP, any for-profit can apply for it. Uh, any sole proprietor or independent contractor can apply for it. Uh, and some, some private nonprofits can apply for it. Under the EIDL program, the small business has to have fewer than 500 employees. Okay. Now, you know, in, where we live, 500 employees doesn't sound like a small business. That's a, those are big businesses here. Right. But um, 500 employees are less. So that, that, that means a lot of our businesses in coastal Mississippi would likely be, would be eligible for this. Uh, and again, under the EIDL program, unlike going through an SBA approved lender, this is one where you'd actually go to the SBA website. So that's kind of a, a basic overview of both of those. Uh, and it's not an either or thing. You can, you can be eligible for both of them. And so what I recommend to business is apply for everything you're eligible for. Uh, make sure you're doing your research. There are lots of great res uh, resources out there to help you navigate through this, to learn about what the different programs are. Um, and even in the broader stimulus, there might be other programs, depending on what kind of business you are, that could also help you. And so, you know, we're, we're very blessed to have the internet and, and all of the resources on it. Uh, but it's a, this is a great thing to really dive into if you're a business owner, understand it and apply for the things that you're, that you're ultimately eligible for under the law. Yeah. Thank you, Ashley. What, what I hear is that whether you are a nonprofit or, or for-profit, if you have 500 or fewer employee, employees, rather, that you can apply for both of these. Um, and and I, it's I, my understanding also that both of them can become grants um, should you meet the, the eligibility requirements. Um, they both can become grants, but right. no one should yeah. go in thinking that they will become grants. That's right, because you know there are there are federal regulations, and they will check to make sure that these eligibility requirements are met. And so, you know, um, everyone needs to go into it with the assumption that you may have to pay it back. Uh, but uh, certainly, you know, being educated about what those grant provisions are can allow you to understand what you have to do in order to meet the criteria to turn it in from a loan to a grant. All right. So everybody do your due diligence and make sure that you're meeting those requirements. Um, Ashley, let's talk about health insurance. You know, a lot, you know, a lot of people are, you know, were having health issues before this happened. Um, this certainly has brought on major health issues for those that have been affected by the virus directly. What can people do to make sure that they have insurance? Those that have been furloughed versus let go. First of all, would you mind explaining the difference between letting someone go and if your employer has said furlough to you? What, what, what does that mean? So furlough would be like uh, taking a long vacation. You're still an employee. You're still officially legally an employee, but for whatever reason, uh, there is a set period of time or maybe even an indeterminate period of time uh, that you either aren't directly working or not receiving a paycheck. Uh, if you've been let go, if you've been terminated, then you are no longer an employee of that company. And, uh, you know, you, you do not expect that at some point you will go back to your job. You will go back to work. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing about, about the way this has evolved over the last month, uh, based on the stimulus, based on this CARES Act, which was, you know, my days are starting to run together, but it was passed about two weeks ago. Right. You know, there were some organizations, some companies that had let employees go uh, originally. And then because of the eligibility for assistance through the, the CARES Act, uh, they put some of them back on and actually furloughed them. Um, you know, in many cases, that gave them the hope they needed that they would be able to financially make it through it. So, you know, with that in mind, um, you know, even if you have been let go, uh, in some cases, it may not be a bad idea just to touch base with your employer. I mean, a lot of these folks that were let go, it wasn't for disciplinary reasons, sure, right. just for cash flow, just because of the economic uncertainty. Uh, and so talking to your employer, you know, asking them uh, or your previous employer, asking them if they've, have they looked at these programs and what, you know, what might decisions might they make based on that? It's always a good idea. But let's assume for a second that, you know, you've been let go. 
uh, and you don't have a way to get back employed immediately. And, and I should say here, because I think this is important, you know, what we're seeing in this, this economy right now is sectors, a wide variety of sectors, diverse variety of sectors that are being hit very hard. But there are some in specifically uh, that are still in high demand because there is a lot of consumer demand, grocery stores, uh, Walmart, uh, you know, small retailers that are remaining open, uh, certain types of health care, certain types of manufacturing, especially folks that are, that are manufacturing health equipment and uh, personal protective equipment, things like that. And they're hiring up very quickly. And so, you know, if you have been let go and you, uh, and you want to get back employed quickly, there are, some, there are still some opportunities out there to find, to find jobs, maybe even temporarily. Um, but let's, let's say for a second that, you, that you're not in that situation and you've been let go and you don't have a job. You know, th there is something called COBRA, which if you did have health insurance before, uh, will allow you to maintain that coverage over a period of time as long as you're eligible for that. Um, the government has also made some provisions in the Stimulus Act, for example, to make sure that, you know, if people were to get infected with COVID-19, um, that they could have assistance on any medical bills or, or costs that would come up as a result of that, because the last thing that, that they want to see is people that are infected that are not getting treatment or are you know not, not being uh, not staying in isolation because they're afraid of the of the cost. Uh, and there are nonprofit agencies out there that also help with that type of thing. And so, you know, it's another one of those places where the internet is such a great resource because. There are so many places online you can go and you can say, you know, I've been laid off. I don't have health insurance. What are my options? Uh, and there are uh, very good resources that can walk you through exactly how to do those things, exactly how to find out what you, what you might be eligible for. And so, you know, it's, it's definitely a concern, but, you know, unlike uh, small economic recessions, it's a concern that's so widespread that there are a lot of things now in place to help people that are that could be in those situations because a lot of folks are in that in very similar boat with that. Right, right. Um, so we hope soon that all of this will pass. Yeah. Um, as as trials and tribulations and 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 it all goes, they things do tend to pass. That's right. When this passes, what are some things that you can say that small businesses can begin to do now or think about doing so that they are ready to stand up faster once this does pass? Absolutely. You know, being turnkey ready is so important. And when I, what I mean by turnkey ready is, you know, depending on what kind of business you are. And, you know, some, business are, is, some businesses are service providers. Uh, you know, some may be restaurants, they may actually sell products, but, you know, ensuring that you've either got a stock of products to sell when the time becomes uh, available to do that, uh, making sure you've got the workforce and the staffing you need to operate the business, uh, you know, making sure that uh, you've got all the, the things in place, your social media, your advertising to let people know that you, you know, when you're going to be reopened. And I know that's a tough thing right now for a lot of businesses to say, because we don't know what's going to happen with, you know, with government shutdowns, but, you know, essentially being ready to walk in that door and, and, and go back to operating is important. Now, having said that, you know, I think the things that a lot of people like me that, that spend probably a, a, a maybe too much time sometimes reading about the economy and studying the data, the things that people like me are worried about is, especially in a market like ours, how fast will some sense of normalcy return? And for a lot of our small businesses on the coast, uh, you know, you've got, you've essentially got two types of small businesses in the community. You've got the kind of small businesses that, that serve the local population. And then in a community like ours, you've got small businesses that serve both the local population and the visitors, the tourists that may come in. Right. And so for us, what recovery means is not only getting our, our local population back up and spending their money and going to businesses, it also means getting our visitors and our tourists back because that's a big part of the earnings and a lot of the sales for a lot of our small businesses. And so until both of those things are able to happen, um, you know, it, there's gonna continue to be some disruption. And so that's why it's important not only to look at what's happening 
in, in Mississippi or on the coast, but also to look at what's happening in neighboring states in Alabama and Florida and Louisiana, because a lot of those people are the same people that come to the coast and, and do shopping here or come here for entertainment or, or go to the gaming uh, resorts. You know, and so that's that's really important. And so, you know, in, in many ways, this is a this is going to be a big regional issue for us. But here's the good news, and I and I mean this sincerely. I think that you know, it's it's, it's easy to be a cheerleader, and it's easy to say, you know, everything's going to be fine. And and I'm not one that wants to do that. I want to be very realistic about what's going to happen. But I think that there is some very good news in the sense that, you know, in terms of travel and tourism and visitation the likelihood after this event is over and after the, the threat has passed is that a lot of the travel is going to be car travel. It's going to be regional travel. There will be less international travel, less flying travel to other markets. And that's very good for us because that is the type of market that we attract now or attracted before the pandemic started. And so the ability for, uh, you know, to have people that drive in, that come to have outdoor recreation, that want to come to the beaches, that want to come uh, to the casinos, that want to come shopping, you know, that's a good thing for the coast because it means that when those things occur, uh, we might be, in a, at least for a temporary amount of time, we might be in a, in a good position to get a lot of that drive-in business. And I know that, you know, Milton Sagara and, uh, our folks that are in the hospitality business are taking a real close look at that and they're working real hard to make sure that they are prepared as soon as the all clear is given to do everything in their power to get those visitors and get those tourists back so that we can get their money back and we can get their spending back in our economy. And that's important. Um, my takeaway from what you said and everybody will glean something different, but stay engaged with your employees. Yes. So that when the time comes that you are released to be able to open your businesses, you don't have to go and gather them because you've already been talking with them and keeping them abreast of, of developments as they've come to you. And then also use this time to plan, use this time to vision um, what your company or business can be once this thing lifts. Is that what I hear? I think you're exactly right. And, you know, and, and I'll just I'll take it a step further and say. You know, every big disaster, every big economic shift like this, uh, it creates a lot, of, a lot of pain and a lot of trouble for a lot of businesses, but it also creates new opportunities that might not have existed before. Right. And, you know, for those business people, those entrepreneurs among us that are smart and that are really looking at how those changes occur and are, are responding to those changes, there's going to be some opportunities, some, some new ways to, to, you know, to build business. And, um, and that's going to be important going forward. Uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of them and a lot of folks are talking about this. This is something I'm thinking a lot about, you know, because, you know, the short-term recovery uh, is going to be one thing. The long-term economic recovery is going to be another thing. And that's something I'm going to be spending a lot of time on is how do we position our region in coastal Mississippi to be uh, at a competitive advantage for that long-term recovery, for, for figuring out what you know, what the economy is going to look like after this is said and done with and making sure that we're doing the things, you know, now immediately to position ourselves for that. Um, remote work is going to probably continue to be a reality for us. You know, there are a lot of people that have figured out that they like this remote work. And there's a lot of business owners that have figured out, you know, my employees are, are happy and they're productive and I don't have the overhead costs associated with having them in an office and this might be something that they will continue as a, you know, as a potential cost cutting measure while there's some uncertainty. So people that are able to service, uh, that are provide technology, that are able to provide delivery services for, you know, for people that are in that situation, that's going to be an opportunity. You know, I think that there is going to be uh, a little bit of a re renaissance for some small businesses because a lot of the economic data I see shows that, um, you know, a lot of the big national retailers uh, you know, not named Amazon or Walmart or Costco. I mean, those are the right. ones that are going to make it through this pretty well. But right. a lot of the big national retailers that are, have already been having trouble competing sure. will have even more trouble in the future. And if we see some of those start to fold and start to go away, that's going to create some openings for small local businesses to fill some of those gaps. And so, you know, um, you know, it's going to be an interesting kind of change. And this is going to accelerate I think a lot of changes that were already occurring in the economy. And, that, and that's an important distinction to make because 
you know, a lot of the things I think that we're going to see on the back end of this, they're not going to be just brand new things that, that no one ever thought of. They're going to be things that were already happening more slowly, and this is going to make them happen faster. Right. And so it's going to create opportunities in some of those cases faster. Uh, you know, the only difference between something like this and something like maybe Hurricane Katrina is everybody in the world is affected. So everybody's going to be going after those kind of same opportunities. So that's why it's even more important for us to plan and be smart and be prepared and be very strategic about the way we go about our, our holistic, our regional economic recovery. And I think the way we do that is making sure that individually our, our workers and our businesses are positioned to be as successful as they can be, and then collectively to make sure we've got a good unified strategy and a vision for where we want to go. Uh, and then we got to start actually implementing the things necessary to get there. Right. Uh, you know, high-speed internet broadband, 5G is going to be a big part of this. Uh, technology demands. Uh, you know, uh, having, you know, remote working destinations, uh, you know, co-working spaces, that's going to be a big part of this. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's, that's a place that we can potentially be competitive. So, and there are going to be a lot of resources to help. So I think that, you know, even though we're in a bad economic situation right now and that could continue, I think there's a lot of hope, uh, as well. And, you know, the, the, the most immediate issue is going to be making sure that you can get through this storm to good weather on the other side so that you can be in a place as a business uh, to jump on those opportunities when they come. But the, in the short term, you got to make it. And that's been the struggle for a lot of folks. Right. What, one of the things that you said, uh, my mom used to always remind me that the sun is always shining. Like right. that, you know, when God set it in order, the sun always is going to shine. It's gonna, the sun is going to come out and the moon is going to come out. You can't always see it because of the clouds, uh, but it's always there. And so that, that is akin to some of the things that you just said right then is that there's always opportunity. There's always hope, um, not in any way to um, diminish the suffering that we're seeing and, and the, the, the death that we're seeing, um, you know, by scores. Um, but, but also knowing that at some point we're going to find ourselves out of this and we want to find ourselves better uh, than we were when we went in. Uh, actually, we have a question for you as uh, relating to PPP. And someone is asking, what insight can you give to those business owners who have had a hard time getting their PP loan or had difficulty in getting approved for the PPP loan? Sure. You know, so that certainly has applied to a lot of folks. And, uh, you know, if you watch the, the nightly news or any of the news channels, you hear a lot of reports about it's happening all over the country. The best advice is be persistent because the good news is you have until December 31st uh, to qualify for this loan. Uh, now, a lot of folks can't wait till December 31st because they've got to have they got to have the resources and the cash fusion now. Uh, but you're not going to run out of eligibility in the next few few weeks if you're you know if you're not able to get get through the process. So persistence is important. Talking to your banker uh, is important. If you've got you know most businesses are going to have an existing relationship with a bank, maybe even a local bank in some cases. And, and in fact, uh, even better if you've got a local bank because you know they know you and you can talk to them personally. And so working with your local banks, uh, you know working with uh, folks that have that you've worked with in the past on financial issues is going to be important and just keep at it because you know the thing about it is you know it's 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 e it's easy to criticize and I'm one of the worst about it you know I, I look at what's not happening the way it should be happening uh, and I just want to change it right away but when I take a step back and I look at what has happened over the last four weeks the volumes of unemployment claims the volumes of uh, loan applications there is no bank or, or no state agency in America that was designed to handle this volume coming in. Uh, this is unlike anything we've ever seen. It's unprecedented. And, uh, you know, you hate to look at people and say, well, be patient. But, you know, in some cases, that's the reality of the situation we're in. There's just so much volume right now coming through the system of people that are either filing for unemployment or, or applying for loan programs that the infrastructure is in some cases not handling it very well. But everything I hear across the board is they are quickly working to, uh, to get that infrastructure in place and to get it staffed up and to get it uh, working better so that it can serve these people. Because I think everybody realizes whether it's, whether it's a banker or whether it's uh, you know, someone from the government side, you know, the most important thing is getting, these, getting the money into the hands of these businesses so they can keep going. 
And the last thing they want to do is for it to be any slower than it needs to be because the whole purpose of it is to keep businesses going. So they all have just as much interest as the business does in seeing this get done. Um, and, you know, when you've got everybody working towards the same goal, a lot of times you'll have good outcomes. And I think in this case, that is exactly what we see, are, we're seeing happening. Right. So I hear you saying that it, it really, it, and we, I think we can all understand that it doesn't feel good in the moment for sure, but um, that we were not equipped, you know, as Americans being the, the greatest country um, that we all believe um, in the world, um, who could have ever foresaw um, this type of crisis, you know? And so um, one of the points that you made is that, you know, all sectors of the economy have to get up and moving and we all want that happening. And I would imagine the government would want that as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they've done is um, made the decision to give the $1,200 per adult yes. um, uh, payment um, to households and the other pieces of, of, of legislation around that in terms of unemployment insurance and so forth. Um, I know that they're wanting that to get into the economy, yes. to boost the economy back up, but we're on lockdown. That's right. So um, talk with me about, I mean, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, I know, you know, we, you know, we want people out spending, but we right. can't go out and do a lot of spending. That's right. I mean, you know, you know it's clearly that money uh, has the most short-term value uh, for the economy if it's spent, if it gets right back in circulating in the economy. Uh, you know, individuals are going to have to decide, you know, how best to utilize those funds. I'm sure a lot of folks are going to have to spend them because they've just got expenses that are piling up. And, you know, in many cases, we may see that going into, into groceries and supplies and things that, you know, that people are getting low on. Uh, you know, gas prices are really good right now, but we don't have anywhere we can go. So it's kind of a <laughs> you know, catch-22. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, the, the key is going to be when things open up and there's, no, there's a lot of questions. I mean, I have a lot of questions about this because, you know, so much is going to be dependent upon not just when we open up, but how we open up. So for example, if we open the economy back up, but we keep, you know, six foot distancing in place because there's still virus circulating, then the number of customers that can be in a, a business at one time is going to be lower and that's going to be an issue. You know, if we, if the CDC requires that everybody wear a face mask uh, when we open back up, then, you know, people are probably not going to be doing much eating at restaurants because it's kind of tough to eat with a face mask on. And so, so there's a lot of, you know, the, I think that a lot of people are focused on the when, but the how is also going to be really important because that's going to affect people's behavior and consumer behavior is ultimately what's going to drive the economic recovery. So, you know, really what's going to be important for us is not just when do we start opening back up in some phases or in some localities, but when do we start opening back up in a way that commerce returns to normal or to at least as close to normal as we can expect. Right. So we, our time is, we're a little over time here, but I have one last question for you. Um, we know that before this crisis um, came about that there were gaps. You know, you and I talked briefly yesterday. There, there will probably always be those that have and those that, that don't. Talk with me a little bit about what you feel that maybe uh, this crisis has the opportunity um, to widen those gaps. What, what would you say to someone who says that? No, I think, I mean, I think that's true. And I think it's hard for anybody that's being honest to, to take a look around at our economy and not, and not admit that there are gaps and that there are, uh, that there have, all, there have been gaps and there are gaps that need to continue to be worked on. And, uh, you know, the hard thing about this, you know, and I'm, I don't say this um, in a theoretical way. I mean, I think the data proves it out. The hard thing about an economic disaster is it disproportionately affects the most vulnerable in our society, typically. Um, and this one is not gonna be any different. You know, the, it, it disproportionately affects people that are at the most vulnerable end. And good economists, any good economist that I've ever heard from in my entire life will tell you that in order to have a good, sustainable, well-functioning economy, you've gotta figure out a way to make sure that the folks uh, at the lower end of that economy are as successful as the folks at the higher end of that economy. And that's the case here on the coast. It's the case in Mississippi. It's the case all over our country. And, you know, I think the good thing about this stimulus program is uh, in many cases, it does allow for 
uh, assistance to go to that, that those more vulnerable populations, whether it's individuals because of their socioeconomic status, or whether it's small businesses, whether you know minor, minority-owned small businesses or businesses in, in areas that have already seen uh, a lot of economic trouble. You know, they're, they're eligible for just as much help in many cases as those in, in thriving metro areas like Nashville or Austin, Texas. Um, and so that's important because it's something that we're going to see affecting a lot of places in America. Um, but, you know, there's going to be a lot of other work that has to be done in addition to just these loan programs to make sure that we're responding to the needs of, uh, you know, of, of the folks that are vulnerable in our society, the folks that might be falling through those gaps. Um, you know, I think it's very important. There's a lot of discussion right now going on in Washington about the potential for additional stimulus. In fact, you know, they're, they're actually trying to put more money uh, in the PPP program right now, $250 million, or bi excuse me, billion dollars. Right. Billion, billion dollars. Billion with a B. Yeah, we're talking about real money. Uh, they're, they're starting to put that in the PPP program just to make sure it can serve all the needs. Uh, and I don't think that that will, I don't think we've seen the end of it. I think that as people that are falling through these cracks are identified, uh, because again, every place in America is dealing with the same issue. Uh, there's going to be, I think, action in Washington to try to find programs or ways uh, to help make sure that those needs are met. Uh, and that's something I know a lot of people are going to advocate for. But it's also a, a responsibility we're going to have locally. Nonprofits, uh, other folks locally, we're going to have to make sure that we find a way to spend our money with small businesses, to spend our money with the people that are, at mo that are most vulnerable, to buy their services, uh, to make sure that these folks can come through. Because the last thing that we need is a big segment of our local or regional population being in real bad shape, uh, you know, because that will, that will affect everybody. It'll affect the whole economy. So, you know, this, this, is, a, this is an event that, that can be, you know, I, and sometimes I say, you know, it doesn't really discriminate against anybody because everybody's affected, but it, sometimes it can affect most vulnerable even worse. And so those are folks that we're going to have to look out for as we go forward to make sure that everybody can be a part of this recovery. Thank you, Ashley. So the, you know, the vision, you know this, the vision of, of Legacy Business League, because you, you've known Angie for years, you and, I, sure, you and yeah. I have known each other for about a year now through Gulf Coast Business Council. Um, but the vision of Legacy is to make sure that those that are minorities are, you know, at the table, that they understand what's going on, that there be no question um, about, um, you know, them having access to, to those services. And so thank you so much for coming on and, and talking with us and, uh, yeah. and being a good friend to, to us, but then also to the organization. So we appreciate you. And um, I think that's it. Did you have any closing words? No, I, look, I just appreciate all the great work you guys are doing. This is, this is God's work. And I appreciate the work you guys are doing. And, and let me just say, um, you know, uh, you've got my phone number, got my email. If anybody got has uh, you know additional questions that I can help them with, they can call me anytime. I'll be happy to, to work with them individually. Whatever we can do to help folks get through this, I mean, that's what we get paid to do. So whatever I can do to help, I'm happy to do. And thank you all for the work you do. Thank you, Ashley. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Bye.